This is the Growth Podcast. My name is Aaron Chivitarese, and today I'm sitting here with Bill Cates, referral coach and author of Radical Relevance. Bill, welcome to the Growth Podcast. Hey, thank you. Appreciate it. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you here. So, Bill, we've been chatting a little bit before jumping on. I'm very excited about this episode. You have a wealth of experience to bring the, the, the viewers um, and the listeners. But before we jump in, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I guess it depends on how far back you want to go or about myself is initially what I've done. So uh, I'm a playful guy. <laughs> I like to have a lot of fun. Uh, I take life seriously, but myself not too seriously. Uh, but, uh, you know, a little bit of my history. I was, uh, after I graduated from the university, I was a drummer in a rock and roll band for a few years. And I traveled around the country playing drums and uh, almost going deaf doing that with the big amplifiers around me and had a blast. But uh, I did a little uh, assessment of my talent and I realized, you know, if I stay this path, I'll probably be playing holiday inns the rest of my life, uh, which I certainly didn't want to do. Uh, so then I moved on to some, some other things and got into some publishing, book publishing. And, uh, and for the last 25 years, I've been helping businesses grow through referrals, through introductions, through more effective messaging. And I'm sure we'll get into all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Effective messaging. Wow. We could talk for years about that. <laughs> Especially uh, yes, we could. Yeah. So take me back a little ways. You, yeah. when, you, when you moved into the space 25 years ago, I mean, that's a long history of entrepreneurship and business. Yep. What was it you were trying to achieve back then? Can you remember sort of your motivation to get started? Yeah. So um, if you don't mind, I'll go a little further back. Uh, just kind of how I got into entrepreneurship at all, which was, uh, I mean, I, my parents were, you know, uh, they, they grew through, up through the uh, depression. So they were very non-risk takers. Uh, I don't know how I became a risk taker knowing my parents. You know, my mother was, you don't, quit one job until you have the next job lined up and, and you don't owe anybody any money and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, so I was helping this woman, uh, produce this book, uh, actually a strawberry cookbook of all things. And she kind of took me for all my ideas, but, uh, decided to go out on her own. And I said, you know, I could do a better job than she, what she's doing. So I found somebody to write a strawberry cookbook. I identified 1,500 pick-your-own strawberry farms around the country. And I started selling this book to pick-your-own strawberry farms. People check out with bushels of strawberries. They need recipes, right? They need something to do with all those. So I was selling. First year, I sold about 10,000. Second year, about 15,000. But strawberry season is very short, except for maybe California and Florida. So I wanted something with a longer growing season. I mean, I had no idea I was going to get into the cookbook thing. It just kind of happened, right? And so I decided to do an apple cookbook, uh, longer growing season. I started selling a lot of those. And then apple growers have <clears throat> apiaries because they need the bees to pollinate the flowers, the blah, blah, blah. So I did a honey cookbook, rounded it out with a vegetable cookbook. And I was selling like 80,000 books a year to farmers of all people. And people would check out with vegetables or apples or strawberries. And that's kind of where I learned this idea of relevance and making sure you have the right product for the right person at the right time and the right medium, all of the basic tenets of marketing, really. Um, and then I decided to get into doing specialty cookbooks for manufacturers of equipment, like smokers and, and grills and blenders and things like that. And I wasn't doing so well. Um, I just, I was struggling. And uh, I woke up one morning and I realized maybe the name of my company was not helping me. And so my company name at the time was WRC Publishing, which means nothing. William Richard Cates, right? That's my name. So I changed it to the American Cooking Guild. Now, if you manufacture a grill and you want a cookbook for, to go with the grill, right, when it goes in the box, do you go to WRC Publishing or do you go to the American Cooking Guild? And that's, you know, you know that's all she wrote, so to speak. It's like my business really took off from there. And I did a grill cookbook and a smoker cookbook. I did a cookbook for American greeting cards, cookies around Christmas to sell in gift stores. And, and my biggest sale, I'll make it a short one, a short story here is uh, Bumblebee Tuna discovered one of my uh, seafood books and they ordered 400,000 copies of that book to uh, give away in grocery stores as a premium. 
And uh, I joke that I was the sales rep. I got a good commission and I was a company owner and got all the rest. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, eventually sold that business. Interesting. Wow. And it all yeah. started with some strawberry cookbooks, hey? So yeah, just it's just an idea that I saw. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I was a sociology major. They say that liberal arts majors often make good entrepreneurs because we learn how to learn. So I learned how to learn. I learned how to figure it all out. And I had another book publishing company that I had started uh, with a partner. And that's where I learned the pros and cons of going into business with a partner. Uh, and I eventually sold that to my partner to move on to do other things. And a buddy of mine says, you know, you should be a writer, speaker, consultant. You'd be good. You've learned a lot, you know, and I go, okay. And so slowly I started working into helping other business owners expand and grow. Yeah, absolutely. You need to get that, that wealth of wisdom out to the world at some <laughs> point, right? <laughs> That's perfect. Well, yeah. And, and sometimes you don't even, you know, realize what you have until you start to talk to people and help them solve problems. And, you know, I'm sure you've, this has happened to you. You say something to someone to you, it's just what you know, it's what you say, it's what you talk about. And to them, it's like, whoa, that is so insightful. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> Profound. What we know. Yeah, it's true. Um, so let's talk a little bit about partnerships because that's an interesting topic. Yeah, um, yeah. Maybe for the listeners who haven't experienced a partnership and they're wondering, should I get into one? What are the pros? What are the cons? Mm -hmm. What do you have mm -hmm. to say about that? Yeah, I, my main thing would be just based on my own experience is take your time, uh, get to know this person. The, the kind of the joke I make is, you know, when people get married, they tend to court each other for a while. There's, uh, and they get engaged and maybe they live together even these days, right? And so it could be six months, a year, it could be many years. <laughs> uh, and then eventually they get married. But, you know, a lot of businesses, they have a breakfast, they have a dinner, they have a lunch, they drop a business plan on the napkin, the whole stuff, you know, and they say, hey, this is a great idea, let's do it. Let's go into business together, right? 50-50 or whatever. But you don't really know the other person. So what I learned is I didn't know how this other person took in success and I didn't know how he took in challenges and failure and how he'd react. And it was clear fairly quickly that we really came to things very differently. Sometimes we had what I call creative tension, and that's great. I have a, a director of marketing in my current company, and we have some of that creative tension. And it makes my other employees a little nervous. They think like we're arguing, and we're not really. We're just trying to find the best solution. Uh, we get a little attached to our own ideas, right? And then we're willing to challenge. Uh, so that's the good side of a partnership is that creative tension and, and having people that complement and supplement uh, and aren't just like you. Um, that, that usually isn't the good way to get someone just like you. We tend to like people that are like us, but that's not always best for the business. But then you have to be willing to deal with those differences. Uh, and, you know, I know you like to talk about mindset and really kind of comes to that, right? It comes down to how do they approach success? How do they approach money? What's their relationship to money, right? What's their relationship to, to problems and challenges? And, and, you know, you don't find that out after a couple of meals and, and a business plan. Yeah, very true. There's an old saying, um, you're, you're marrying your business partner. <laughs> like, yeah, you, you know, yeah, you, but you, you don't get all the good stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, the chances are good. Um, in all honesty, for those of you who haven't built a business from the ground up, from my experience, I can tell you that you'll probably end up spending more time with your business partner than you will your significant other. Well, it's especially true, especially the on the early stages. Yeah. Especially in the beginning. Yeah. And, and any entrepreneur that's devoted to his or her business, you know, they tend to work more anyway. True. Um, true. And I've seen some couples that are in business together mm -hmm. and, you know, when it works, it really works. Um, right. They just, there's just, and then, and they usually have boundaries. Like they don't talk about business, you know, dinner time or later or whatever. Uh, and I'm sure that's a challenge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. That's an interesting um, dynamic. Some people can pull it off. Some people can't. But when they do, it's yeah. very potent. It's very yep. potent. Yep. Two, two brains are better than one when they're in sync, right? Yeah, I mean, having a partner is powerful. I've always wanted someone partner like, right? Maybe they don't have equity in my business, or they're not a true partner in terms of that. But they, they take an emotional stake in the business, right? They're partner like, 
and they're committed to the business. Uh, and, in, and through adversity, they don't just run, right? Because they're committed to the business. And I actually have a couple of, of employees right now that are like that. And in the middle of this COVID virus and, and all the stuff that we're all going through, which you know, has raised tension for a lot of people and stress, uh, to know people are committed. Now, I've told them, I, I said, my goal is to not have your paychecks impacted by this. Uh, and so far, so good. I got the paycheck program, whatever they call that, uh, protection and, you know, approved and just waiting for it to be funded. I got a disaster loan at 1%. That, so I'm, I'm piling up this money that I may never need. My cash flow may be fine without it, but I've got it if I need it. And if I don't need it, then, you know, I'll just pay it back. Absolutely. That's a good point. Cash flow is something also that people underestimate in business. Hey. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Cash flow. Uh, it, would you say the chances of um, businesses failing in the first two, say five years or whatever, would you say that, well, I'm not going to say anything. What would you say the number one reason or number two reasons that businesses would fail early on would be? Well, clearly uh, a bad idea uh, would probably contribute to a business failing, right? <laughs> Someone who thinks they have a product or service that the rest of the world wants and they don't want it, so that'd be one. Uh, the other would be uh, not communicating, uh, which is what I get into with helping business, not communicating the value, not communicating in a way that is gonna resonate with people and cut through all that noise and spark their, in their interest. You know, I mean, it's, you don't build a better mousetrap and they beat a path to your door, it just doesn't happen. So poor marketing is, is a big one. You get a lot of entrepreneurs or even not even entrepreneurs, but, you know, like engineers, for instance, sometimes they create a great product and engineers can make great business people. Don't get me wrong. But if they don't have someone else to help compensate and think marketing, promotion, you know, sales, all that sort of stuff, then it goes nowhere. And then, yeah, cash flow. I did have a business where I closed it down because I didn't have the cash to do what I wanted to do with it. And I decided that my heart wasn't in it, so I wasn't gonna go get the cash. I could have, I could have raised the money, but it was a newsletter. This was back when they actually had paper newsletters. <laughs> and, uh, and the test went really well. I mean, I was getting great response, and, but then I realized I just did not have the cash to be able to scale this in a way that I really wanted to do it. And, uh, and, and since my heart wasn't in it, I go, you know, why do I wanna do that? It helps when your heart's in it uh, to move forward. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So so to recap, you'd say the top three reasons would be trying to predict the market rather than respond to the actual demand. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Right. Communication, communicating your values and everything yeah, across properly, and, all right? that, yeah. and then cash flow um, to top it all off. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. It's interesting, you know. I've, I've learned recently about people that are pre-selling things like courses and, and masterminds and things before even creating the content, going out to the uh -huh. marketplace, gathering data, and then building content based on the data. That's, I, I had an epiphany when I heard that. I was like, whoa, paradigm shift. You know, well, that, if, if you think about it, that's the way you really should do it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You find the gap and you fill the gap. Right. Rather yep. than try to build your own thing that you think they're going to come by. Why well, would they? Just I, because... I've done both. And I'll tell you, I lost a lot of money doing one. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, we can talk about my failures. I've been very successful, but we can also talk about my failures. <laughs> so for instance, I had this, this product, this training product that I thought was going to be great for banks. I did a little work with banks and I thought I knew what I was doing. And I put this thing together two summers ago. I threw out about, I calculated about 65,000 DVDs and CDs of this course that never went anywhere. Uh, first of all, the course didn't go anywhere, so I had them. Second of all, DVDs and CDs were becoming obsolete slowly but surely. And the first box to throw into the dumpster was hard. It was like my baby. It's like I worked so hard to create this, right? Second one got a little easier, third one got a little easier, and then I just loved tossing those things in there and watching the box explode in the dumpster, and, yeah. and then that got to be fun. So sometimes you have to let go, right? You have to let go yeah, of an idea that just didn't work. That's but big. in my book, Radical Relevance, uh, I have these 17 rules of radical relevance, and, and rule number two is give your clients or give your customers a seat at the table, meaning don't really ever develop products, services, and the messaging, the marketing messages around those 
without talking to some customers or clients and maybe even some prospects with whom you have a good relationship, right? At least anecdotal research, if not formal research to, to make sure you really are onto something. And, and don't say, hey, would you buy this? And all your friends, clients who are your friends say, oh yeah, yeah, I buy it. And then when it's time to write the check, they, well, I got to go to the board. I got to, let's think about it, right? So you got to ask the right people for feedback. Ah, that's an interesting point, actually. Yeah, yeah, interesting point. Okay, so yeah, let's talk about um, communication deeper sure. because that's a massive, massive topic, and mm -hmm. um, possibly, possibly under undervalued with a lot of people. They it comes back to thinking that your message is the only message and just blasting it out and being pushy. Um, I found that was a problem with me younger, mm -hmm. my younger sales career. I was very pushy rather than asking questions and drawing out information, you know? Um, let's talk a little bit about, you know, how do you, how do you get across your value and cut through all the noise that right. there's so much noise out there? How do you do that with communication these days? Yeah. And, and just a quick comment on that, that pushy thing. It's sometimes uh, we must, we mistake our own passion and enthusiasm for what we do and the value that we bring to people, uh, and and we, and we believe it, and but we we put it, pull it, a, we push it across in a way that does feel pushy to people, mm -hmm. right? And I think there's a difference. I think one needs to feel passionate, if you will, uh, about what they do and the value that they bring, and and feel bold about that, and to do it in a way that's that has a lot of uh, social intelligence, so you can see how people respond. And and you're right, you ask the questions. So I, I think two, two of the biggest challenges we face right now in terms of marketing and marketing messages, number one is just marketing message overload, right? I mean, just it's been estimated the average person gets 3,000 marketing messages a day, and that's just marketing messages. Now, they, they come in different forms, um, but if you think about it, you walk through an airport, right? You get their signs everywhere. It's, now it's on the floor. Now it's on the ceiling. It's like, you know... And so the brain is just going, mm, not relevant, not relevant, not relevant, not relevant. You know what I mean? It's just not paying attention until it sees something that's relevant and then it'll pay attention. So uh, how you cut through all this is you have a message that hits the bullseye in the brain that's you know, relevant to, to, to grab their attention. And you do that, and we can talk about this, by narrowing and targeting your market and getting to the bullseye of your market. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then it also has to be uh, compelling to move them to take action. So I tell people that if, if people are not responding to an email you send to someone, or they're not responding to a, uh, you know, a Facebook campaign that you create, or any type of marketing, if people are not responding, then obviously either the, either the or more like most likelihood it should be, the, either the message wasn't relevant enough, right? You weren't, it wasn't the right combination of method and medium and target and all in the message, or it wasn't compelling. You weren't solving a big enough of a problem, or you weren't promising a big enough of result, a believable result. And so we got to take it on ourselves and, and say, all right, I, obviously I didn't say it in the right way. And then we have to go back and say it in a different way until we eventually find out what, what, uh, what takes. And we always need to make sure that we're not so hung up on how we want to do it and how we want to say it. Um, you know, there's, we want to be able to deliver our message in a way where they were ca capturing the concepts and the words that are already in the brain of our prospect. We can't let cleverness and creativity get in the way of clarity. And that happens sometimes. We think we're being clever, we're being creative, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that as long as it doesn't get in the way of, of, of uh, clarity because the brain seeks clarity. The brain to keep the organism alive, it wants to spend as little energy as possible. The brain's goal is actually to expend as few calories a day as possible. That's why maybe for me, it's hard to lose weight because my brain just doesn't want to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I like it. I like it. <laughs> but with that said, um, that, therefore, if a message is just the slightest bit unclear, the brain's inclination is not to go there. Now, if you have someone that's really interested, they may go there anyway, and they may focus the energy they need to focus, but you lose a lot of people when you try to be a little too creative. Uh, a friend of mine, actually, Zamira Jones, a great marketer, 
said he, he, he likened it to a billboard. If you're driving down the highway and there's a billboard with a message, it's creative, it's fun, whatever, and you don't get it at first, and 30 seconds later, oh, I knew what they were saying. The billboard didn't do its job because you're past the exit, right? It's gotta, it's gotta resonate what's already in the brain, the concepts that are already in the brain. And how do you get those? You give your customers or clients a seat at the table, right? You talk to them, you talk about your value, your product, your service, whatever, and see how it resonates with them and see what concepts and words and phrases they think of. And those are usually the ones you wanna use. Ooh, I love it, that's awesome. It's so true. I love the billboard analogy. That's really good. That the good? exit. Yeah. It's really good. I thought I, I thought I knew where you were going with it, but then when you said you missed the exit, that's, <laughs> that's the key right there. You missed the exit. Yeah, I get you. And if you have time, you're too young to know these, these old <laughs> uh, roadside things that they're called Burma Shave. And it was a shave cream and they had these roadside things and it would tell like a joke or a riddle over the course of, you know, a quarter mile with these roadsides. And you would, it would engage people and, they, and then you'd see what the thing is at the end and you got to go do whatever they say because they brought you into their story, you know? Uh, oh, most that's people really don't know smart. how to do that anymore. That's really smart. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. It, it, it brings them down on a journey and then it gives them a call to action at the end, right? Yeah, yeah. The last so billboard. One, <laughs> yeah, so one can build on the next. Yeah. And if you know you have someone, whether it's, you know, it could be digital, it could be Facebook, it could be lots of different ways, but if, it could be a, a, you know, a building of messages. Uh, your first message may not to be to sell anything at all, right? Just to put something out in the, and the next thing could be a, a, a sale to click on a lead magnet or something. So it's, these things can build, which can be a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very true. Very true. And people don't get, people love to buy, but they don't like being sold, especially right off the bat, right? You know, you got to yeah. build some value and build some trust and some camaraderie there, um, some rapport, you know. So you meant, you, sorry, you, you mentioned um, narrowing down your, your, your market and hitting the bullseye, hitting your perfect person. That's something that a lot of people struggle with. I think a oh, yeah. lot of people go very broad and they think that they can just hit everybody. But in reality, the more niche down you can get, the better, right? So how does someone go about hitting their bullseye? How do they find the bullseye? Sure. Well, at First of all, yes, the, the, the power of doing that, and, and, and I kind of liken it to a target and then a bullseye. And so a target could be an industry, let's say, or it could be a bigger, it could be women, it could be working women, it could be pregnant women, uh, just what's occurs to me at the moment. Uh, and, but, you know, how do you go narrower than that? You know, is it pregnant women who are, uh, you know, have to stay in bed for the last three months of their pregnancy? Now you got a bullseye with a certain product service of something that brings them value, right? So, so when the mistake that most people make is that they, they, you're right, they kind of expand the message. They brought, you know, I don't wanna leave these people out and I don't wanna leave these people out. But the problem is every time you expand to include more people, you actually weaken the message and run the risk of not including anybody. So yes, you can have more than one target. You can have more than one perfect fit client or customer, which is the bullseye. I'll give, I'll give you an example in a second. Um, but when you do that, then of course your messaging is spot on, right? The biggest thing in marketing and sales, both, is empathy. In marketing, it's displaying, uh, bringing people in with a, with a knowingness of their situation, right? The, the, how you talk about the problems, how you talk about the opportunities. People go, ah, this, they kind of know me. They get, they get a sense of me at least, right? I mean, how much marketing to the you and I and everyone listen to this get that from people that have no clue who we are, right? They don't take the time. Uh, even personal services, a one-to-one -one email, they don't take the time to figure out who we are. And so, um, the, you know, so we got to narrow that down as best we can. Let me give you an example. So Adam is a, a financial advisor. I, I do work with a lot of financial advisors. So I'll, I'll use him as an example. All right. Financial advisor wants to work with uh, wealthy individuals. Well, Duh, of course, right? So, but that's not a target. And then he wants, where's a lot of the wealth? Well, it's in small business owners. Okay, that's better, but that's also still pretty big because there's all kinds of different kinds of businesses that have different issues, right? Then he decided he wanted to go, he wanted to pursue what he called uh, white coat professionals. 
So to him, that was doctors, uh, dentists, uh, pharmacists, and optometrists. But that's four different businesses, four different targets. The demographics are different and the psychographics are different. The, the emotional aspect of the relationship to what he does is different. And he realized he couldn't start four businesses at once. So he ended up picking optometrists because his wife is an optometrist. And what happened is he became not just a financial advisor to optometrists, he ended up becoming a business advisor to optometrists because he just learned how they work and he could cross pollinate ideas from one optometrist to the other without you know, revealing proprietary secrets and such. And so that's a pretty darn good bullseye, but he actually went further. And this is something that evolves for most businesses. It's hard to start out with this, generally speaking. And it was optometrists that want to sell their business in five years. And so now he's created a national reputation, which doesn't happen a lot in financial services, of people, optometrists that want to sell their business. Adam's the guy. And the phone's ringing all the time, and he closes 90% of that business. Um, so that's, that's what happens when you find the bullseye, and the message gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And so therefore, and you talked about asking questions, the questions you ask get better because they're targeted. The questions you ask actually create knowingness for that situation. They demonstrate knowingness, right? Mm. If I ask you a question and you go, oh, that's a good, you know something about my world, Bill. You know, I like you. I, 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 there's value there, right? So that's the power of the narrowing. Mm, yeah, yeah, true. Exactly. The narrow, yeah, that makes complete sense. I love it. Um, so you mentioned his phone's ringing off the hook and he's closing. Now, are a lot of those coming from other referrals? Say he helps yeah. a guy to sell his business and then he refers him. Um, I know you talk a lot about turning your referrals into personal introductions and the power of a personal introduction. Um, yeah. A short story about me real quick about introductions. I use the power of this in my insurance sales days, my first job mm -hmm. out of college. Mm -hmm. And I would go sell an insurance package to somebody. Who do you want me to talk to next? Even if they didn't tell me anybody, I go next door and say that they did. <laughs> <You Okay. know? laughs> I'd be like, you know, the guy next door bought it. He said to come walk around, talk to whoever's around. And they, oh, that sounds good. A lot of times it was, please go speak to my family. Go speak to my uncle. That would work very of well, of course. Personal yeah. introductions. You're halfway in the door when you get there. They know you're coming, yeah. right? It's, so, bar it's borrowed trust. It works because you're borrowing the trust in one trust. relationship long enough to earn your own trust in a new relationship. And that's, say that again? that's why the ref so it, uh, referrals or introductions, and I tend to use the word introductions a lot more these days than referrals because it's just so hard to reach people. We got to get connected. Mm. In fact, the fastest way, go back to radical rules of relevance, rule number one is the fastest, shortest way to, 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 to get on someone else's radar, to relevance with a stranger, is an introduction from someone they know and trust, right? And so it's borrowed trust. So I borrow the trust let's say you're referring me to your sister, I borrow the trust that I have with you long enough to earn my own trust with your sister. Mm. Uh, you you vouch for me, you, you recommend me, she trusts your judgment, right? That's the borrowed trust. Now, that'll carry you so far. And depending on the nature of the relationship, it, it could conceivably carry you all the way through the sale, depending on what you sell and, and, and how, you know, how expensive and how much deliberation is needed. Um, you know, my friend used you, I, that's good enough for me. I'll use you too. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that's usually not the case. So that's where the, the, how we talk about our value and being relevant and compelling starts to, to play a role in all of that. Um, yeah, absolutely. So just a tip for everybody listening. Uh, when you're talking with, uh, with clients or customers or prospects or, you know, centers of influence, other people who can find, you know, refer people to you, you really want to use the word introductions. You know, how would you like to introduce me to George? My guess is Laura would prefer to hear from you before she hears from me. Let's talk about what the introduction looks like. We really want to be assumptive around that introduction because, you know, anything short of that and it, and it just may not work. We may not get connected. Mm, that's a very valid point. Your future pacing, using the word introduction quite heavily, hey? Yeah, I'm, I mean, and it's been around forever. I mean, before there was internet, telephone, telegraph, 
someone would try to do business in another town, usually it was men at the time, so I could say he, uh, would bring what? A letter of introduction, right? And it was at borrowed trust. If so-and-so said, you can trust this person, he's trustworthy, right? Um, I know him, I vouch for him. Guess what? That's, that's a foot in the door and that's uh, probably some business. Yeah. So that's, you know, that whole borrowed trust thing's been around forever. Yeah. And that's going to, that's more than likely going to lead to an appointment that actually sticks. Hey. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, all the businesses I work with, the, uh, yeah, the appointment setting rate is higher. The stick rate with the appointments are higher, mm -hmm. you know, conversion from prospect to client higher with a lot of industries, the average sale is higher. So uh, from your old world insurance, the, the, the average case size of an insurance policy is twice that when it comes from a referral rather than leads or other methodologies. Mm -hmm. uh, studies have shown that uh, clients or customers stay with the business longer if they were introduced or referred. And uh, one study I saw showed that a client or customer that comes into a business through a referral slash introduction is two and a half times more likely to give referrals because they met you that way. So they're going to be a little more predisposed to help you meet others the same way they met you. Mm. So there's, there's so much value to that. And yet most businesses see it kind of as icing on the cake. You know, yeah, we get some referrals, but it really is the cake for most businesses, not all businesses, yeah. especially professional services and or long sales cycle or complicated sale. You know, that introduction is just, is, is, you know, everything really. Yeah, right. And it starts a, a, an introduction snowball effect, <laughs> really, right? It does, right. And, uh, and you keep bringing people in who met you that way, then it creates a critical mass. Mm. And it, it takes on a life of its own and it gets easier and easier. But if you, if you build your business based on internet leads or other methodologies, and I'm not saying we don't play with that stuff, but if that's how you're meeting people, those people are going to be a little less predisposed to introduce you to others. So that way it's going to be a little tougher over time. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I actually never considered that the way they came in is how they act in the future. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very true. Um, Okay, well, let's talk a little bit more about your book there for the viewers who are uh, sure. listening. I can see it in the screen here. What's Radical Relevance? I even relevance. have a copy right here. Here, I'll yeah. let me give you one right here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You know, cool. I'm going to do that. One of these days, you know, Aaron, I should have someone like you yeah. have the book and I'll go like this, right? Yeah. And you'll take it on the other side. That'd be That's fun. a great idea. That's a great oh, idea. No. You'd be the first. I haven't seen anybody do that before. That's a great <laughs> idea. Perfect. We so have to talk, practice it before. Yeah, yeah, which side of the screen is it going to come through and stuff. Right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So talk to us about the book. Um, sure. Yeah, yeah, it's super interesting. Um, well, talk, we certainly talk, covered some of it, it already. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the subtitle is Sharpen Your Marketing Message, Cut Through the Noise, Win More Ideal Clients. Mm. So sharpen the marketing message. It's narrowing. We've talked about that, having that target market. Uh, and, and it also helps you with differentiation, right? Uh, Differentiation isn't everything, but it's certainly part of the, uh, the puzzle, especially if you uh, represent a service or product that where there's seemingly alternate choices that are similar. Uh, we do have to separate ourselves from uh, the competition, if you will. So that's part of it as well and how we talk about that. And so the, the, the market and our specialization in a market and or knowing the bullseye can actually instantly create that, that separation, that differentiation. And I also use the word ideal clients. Um, in the book, I use right fit clients or right fit customers. The reason I don't say right fit on, and this is kind of a callback to what we talked about. I don't say right fit on the cover because if I say right fit client, you can kind of guess what I mean, but you don't know exactly because it's not a term that's used a lot, right? It's not in your head going, I need more right fit clients yet. Mm. Right? But we all know what an ideal client is we need at least the concept right so on the book i put ideal clients because i need to resonate with people in that way but then i define an i a right fit client in the book uh and these are essentially uh people that you that were you know you were meant to serve and were meant to be served by you uh they appreciate you for all the reasons you want to be appreciated uh your message resonates with them almost instantly and, and because of that, they like you more quickly. And they're usually more profitable 
right fit clients because it's just a perfect match for what you do and what they want and need. Um, so, and, and that's the bullseye, the right fit, right? The perfect match. And you can have more than one bullseye, right? It doesn't have to be just one in a target. There can be, you know, archery target, one bullseye. Okay, I get it. My world, you could have two or three um, that are all related to what you do, but it's, it, they're different enough that you want to come to each one with a different message. You don't want to try to talk to all three all at once, all the time. Mm. Like on your website, you bring them to the website. Okay, maybe there's an overarching message that kind of resonates with all three, but then you want them to self-identify very quickly. First thing on the website. If you're this, click here. If you're this, click here. If you're this, click here. And then you pull them into their world and empathy for their situation and all the right messaging for that. Um, again, it's all about targeting and, and picking the right message in the right way at the right time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. So, um, yeah, really good. That's very interesting. It's such a relevant topic these days with all the noise, <laughs> right? Like it's just bombarded with, with noise these days. Yeah. I mean, and relevance has always been there. It's always been important from the first time anyone tried to influence another person. Mm -hmm. you, know, you come up with a, 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 a line of logic of reasoning that they're going to appreciate. That's going to be relevant to them. Right. And t these days, I, I say that we live in a radically relevant world because what I mean by that is it is actually so easy if we take the time and know how to do it to create more relevant messaging. So let me, can I give you a couple examples um, and how we can learn from it? So obviously Google is, is the king of relevance, right? The algorithms are all written to when you have a seven word search, it's going to know where you're going in two words. Right? I can name that search in two words <laughs> and because of the way it's, it's a relevance machine and it wants to bring relevant answers to your question. Uh, uh, Amazon, same thing. People who bought this, bought this. People who looked at this, also did, right? It's all algorithms for relevance. Um, when's the last time you went and bought water or, or toothpaste? All the options, right? Smart water, dumb water, flavored water, fizzy water, still water, you know, whatever. Some of them made by the same manufacturers, but different labels to just appeal to the, to the right person at the right time. And this is the one I love the most. Um, again, back to the, uh, the roadsides, uh, the billboards. So the electronic billboards now, many of them are programmed by advertisers, marketers that have studied the demographics of who's driving by the sign at any, any given time of day. So using Waze and using Google Maps, it knows who's driving by the sign at any given time of day. So it changes the ad to appeal to be more relevant to the demographic, right? And then some of these are equipped with pollen sensors. And when the pollen can, count gets to a certain level, it starts to automatically advertise allergy medicines in the local pharmacy. So this is the world we live in. We actually expect and want people who are promoting to us to have a sense of who we are, to know something about us. And so we've got to do this. We, people crave the relevant message to them because it's the only way they can decipher all the noise that's coming at them, right? The brain craves clarity, craves relevance. Yeah. Wow. So true. That's crystal clear. That is crystal and, and, clear. And, you know, you've heard about micro-targeting with the political campaigns. You know, they talk about micro-targeting and all that sort of stuff. That's the same thing. It's all radical. Well, big data allows everyone to do that now. Uh, that's what Facebook is, right? Mm -hmm. Facebook allows you to, to create the perfect demographic, the perfect search. Uh, over time, it learns, right? Facebook does. It's all about being relevant. Absolutely. And people crave it. That's the thing that's important from the other side of the coin. They crave that to actually be drawn towards you, right? They and that's the it. empathy. That's right? the empathy, that's the empathy mm -hmm. right? A knowingness of us, right? That. Yeah, okay, he's kind of talking my language. And, and so what they'll do is they'll give you a, a little more time. Now, if the relevance breaks down at any point in time, you've lost them. But uh, that's what pulls people in is, is the story, the, the connection. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one more piece of science uh, that's, that's very helpful in, in, in how we create our message. Um, and that, this is research done by Antonio Damasio. He's a neuroscientist. And he uh, studied subjects who the part of the brain that felt emotion was damaged, so they could not feel emotion. 
And because they couldn't feel emotion, they couldn't make decisions. They did, couldn't decide if they were going to have corn flakes or wheat flakes for breakfast. No emotion, no decision-making ability. So now we've always kind of sensed that that's true, right? Um, and then, you know, analytical say, well, what about statistics? What about, you know, the, the models and the graphs and the this and the that? Well, those are important too, but at the end of the day, they elicit an emotional response, right? So if you throw out a statistic that says, you know, 75% of people between this age group are woefully ill-prepared for retirement, immediately people go, oh, I wonder if I'm in that 75%, you know, I probably am, Ugh right? Emotional response based on a statistic. So once we know that, that's why I mentioned earlier the, the, the di demographics of our target and then the psychographics of our target. What are the frustrations? What are the fears? What are the uncertainties? You know, what are the, the, the aspirations and the, and, and the opportunities? And that's the emotional response. And so we've got to make sure we talk in those terms. Not 100%, but a lot of it ha is, has to be designed to strike that emotional response. And then people will take action. Yes, yes, exactly. And then people will take action. Right. And as a business owner, entrepreneur, well, we that is the end. <laughs> the end result is take that action and do that With thing. The right people taking the right action. <laughs> the right people taking the right action. I love it. Okay, Bill. Well, <laughs> yeah, Bill, you know, you you've you've brought a lot of clarity to myself and and the listeners for sure because in this world of noise a confused mind always says no we get that but maybe we don't know how to become clear on our message right maybe we don't know how to get into the the empathy flow with the prospect um, i think you brought a lot of clarity to that and this is a very <laughs> relevant conversation so oh, thank quite, you. A, quite and, amazing and, 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 and sometimes it's hard for us to do it for ourselves mm. right I mean, I need people who, I know this stuff, but I need someone else to help me remind myself of this stuff, just like I help other people, right? It, you, you, what's the old expression? You can't see the picture if you're in the frame. Mm. And so that's why your clients can help. That's why friends and colleagues can help. That's why consultants like me, like you can help other people, right? There's getting that outside perspective that's not emotionally attached to every single idea that you ever created. It, can help you get that clarity. Uh, there's another thing that goes on in the brain. If, if, uh, if your message is a little confusing or if your website is a little hard to navigate, if there's a little lack of clarity, then what happens, the brain automatically jumps to the conclusion that doing business with you is complicated. So if figuring out something on your website is complicated, like how to contact you, the basic of things, the brain unconsciously will go automatically start to think, well, these folks are going to be complicated to do business with. I, I, there's other options out there. Yeah. So it's just that whole neuroscience is, is, it fascinates me as you can tell. Oh, me too. I love it. It fascinates me so much. It's amazing. All right, Bill. Well, you know, thank you so much for bringing so much clarity around this topic. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> it's, it's true. It's awesome. Um, everybody needs to hear this message and they need to be very clear on what they're doing and, and just get their message out there where they can actually help impact more people um because that's where we're, we're going for impact here and the, the best way to do that is to become relevant yep. in all of this thing. exactly so for the listeners and the viewers who want to check you out maybe mm -hmm. um go get a copy of your book find you on social media where can they come find you yeah i'll give you a couple options uh we do have a book uh, a, a site for the book so you can look at it and then decide if you want to do it. it's on, on audio it's you know it's digital it's all the various methods and that's radicalrelevancebook.com radicalrelevancebook.com I do have a, a gift for your listeners. Uh, it's a, a guide I've written, and it's, and it's uh, essentially at uh, exponentialgrowthguide.com, exponentialgrowthguide.com. And that's where I blend my 25 years of work with referrals and introductions with this newer work around messaging. Uh, and then my general website is referralcoach.com. And so, uh, you know, th these messages fit together without question. Absolutely. Referralcoach.com. How clear can I get? Not much more clear than that, right? Very good. And all, of those, it, yeah. all of those are linked in the show notes as well. Of course, you can go down there and click on all that. So thank you so much, Bill, for jumping on the uh, growth podcast here with me today. I really appreciate it. And um, I do appreciate your message and congratulations on your book. Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate uh, being with you today.